Final stop at last. Welcome to the last countdown of Mario and Luigi Month, and we couldn't possibly end it in a more fitting way. With the entire subseries revolving around it, the battle systems showcased are always busy, supplying us with spectacular opponents both awesome and complex, and I've been waiting for this opportunity for a thoughtful long time. There's really nothing much for the intro. These are what I feel are the finest of Mario and Luigi's legendary boss gauntlet. Although these battles are famous for a reason, I would like to bring up a spoiler alert. You ready, guys? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Then go to it! Oh, yeah! yeah. yeah. With the titular icons oh so obviously a paired duo, no shit there, it's not hard to guess that the game would play connect the dots with this aspect in some manner. More like they kept playing it straight through their own 9 to 5 and through the week. Hey boss, your ass ain't doing it. Something to the Christian brutal job was ASAP. It's worth getting fired after seeing what you actually friggin' did. Game mechanics touched gently by this prospect, have to sit alongside the boss roster too. Because, geez, it seems a lot of baddies in Superstar Saga lugs with them a partner. Guess it was a 10 for 1 sale. As much as I get an awkward kick out of the lumpy mallet twins and <laughs> the most complete rivalry the bros receive is thanks to the delightfully buffoonish Popple and... Whoa, no way! New character! Oh, it is Bowser. I'm sorry, just... Woo! Masterful recolor. This battle is half raccoon, half cement truck. The sneaky little robber piece of shit plays Killager, trying to swipe your items right from your warm pocket. You better not let him take your shit, or it's gonna be hitting you. Then we have the pissed off elephant in the room. Hamburglar, I mean Bowser. He's essentially a big ass hammer bro. That's no oversight. But what makes their ordinarily bleak solo attacks cool is their team up unity. Combined, they tip past the 400 HP mark which is a lot at this point in the game. Now you can see what your enemies had to deal with constantly. Two fighters joined together is a much bigger challenge than just one, no matter the power. Hell, these two even have their own bros attack, and they know it's called that. Beyond the battle itself, the rivalry is enjoyable in character. Popo and Mario bow to each other before fighting. That's unbelievable. Yeah, I would say that I wish more could have come out of this rivalry in gameplay, but perhaps it's a good thing you don't have to basically fight your own moves. No siree, no chance. All the knees falleth before Opinus. <laughs> Okay, PIT vets, I know what you're mumbling in your head. You gotta be fucking kidding me. He's, he's joking, right? Survey says fuck no. Now as for those in the dark, I've got glow sticks at the ready. Around the time where you've cleared past the midpoint, the story hits us with Thwomp Volcano. Most of the other chapters slap you hard with the whole shrewd threat. As in, most of the enemies and even the bosses are shrewd themed. Didn't have a problem with it at all, but I was waiting for that curious tiebreaker. One that was pure Mario standard, and Bowser lives to be just that. I may have missed out on the genuine Bowser Clash in Superstar Saga, but I feel we get a satisfactory example here. It's from this point in the subseries onward where the obligatory Bowser battle be geared with clever parallelism. You notice how every one of these fights showcase Bowser in the same special condition Mario and Luigi are in? Like how Dreamy Bowser is a real world figure imbued with the power of a dream. So it's obvious that the partnership the bros undergo with their younger selves would be the theme for Bowser this time around. And believe it or not, it's way cooler than it sounds. The battle itself boils down to exactly what we would expect. Adult Bowser serves as the incumbent meat shield and primary tank for the young prince. Stomping, fire breath, all the stuff he usually does. Decent power and always kept coming. It's impractical to try to take down the big Bowser first. If there's anything common sense likes to retweet to one another, it's to always go for the medic. Yes, on top of aiding in team attacks, baby Bowser has a bottomless supply of healing items. Weird, I thought Bowser hated mushrooms. <laughs> what? No meat is shaped that way! <laughs> that is gross. There is a way to separate them through an insane counterattack. I'll be honest, the fight actually isn't all that special. Not all that difficult, even for a novice. And the fucking ice flower chops it into little itty bitty shitty blitty food stuff. But it's still Bowser. Something I was figuratively thirsty for this late in the story. Above all, I also just love the concept. Gaming's most notorious 2v1 matchup meshes with their own rivalrous toddler years to bring us a literal representation of the title. Seeing doubles in our games almost never seems bad. 
Dream Team may have been of all in your face with its subconscious thematics plopped all over, but this most recent spectacle sets focus to one other recurring idea. Strength in numbers. Never mind X and Y, this was the first 3DS RPG to have horde battles as a frontline perspective brought to attention. That, and I feel it's leagues above Gen 6 in that respect. It's no backseat premise, god no. The dream battles can contain up to 25 baddies in arms, there's the Luigi noise twisting the fabric of sanity, and a solid chunk of its bosses contain these same bullet points. Fittingly so, both of these fights represent the strongest contribution to this insane mechanic. The Koopa Troops' finest, their Bowser's own Elite Four. <laughs> if any army were to have nothing but tiny palms, we'd all be bitch slapping each other in the no man's ball pit. No, no, call them the big boys, the Elite Trio, the Foonish Majors, and the General himself. Yoshi's sworn nemesis, Kamek. Before him, these guys were mostly talk, but now, they do. They do war! If I am to draw parallels, the Elite Trio could be considered Alpha Dream's incarnation of the Shadow Sirens. A unified team of three, Goomba, Koopa, Shy Guy, all locked onto a victory, clean or dirty. Each member serves an important use in their own little army. Goomp, with his large infantry and low HP, is the offense. Sergeant Guy relies on tricks, stalling, and his high HP to take a largely defensive role. And Paraplonk's high speed, resilience, and infinite supply of mushrooms ups hold the support role. The whole battle with these guys is a savory gimmick, where they can only be defeated if all three are struck down at once. And with the impressive coverage their combined abilities supply, this battle is much harder than it sounds. It becomes a feverish challenge for the player to multitask, seek out the largest threat firsthand, remain wary of their HP, and don't get lost. It's easy to lose track in this fight, and if you do, your countering game had better be in the Shulk tier. So many varied attacks coming at different speeds and intervals, it's out of hand. These goofs want a promotion so bad, they literally do all they can. Shame too, they worked so hard, but Bowser probably didn't even give them a cookie. Teamwork is a superpower, and the chemistry these three kooks give off, I'd say it works pretty well. Kemic, however, is a one-shell armada. As possibly the highest-ranked member of the army, it's rightful that he'd be threatening. But man, the fourth time around, this wizard swish and flicks around no fucking. He does battle with the bros, as if it's his sworn duty, relentlessly stalling your progress. For three, count them right here, three fights. Before, we had teamwork. Now we have duplication. Kemic and his duplicates are stirring competitors with the trio for their ultimate team synergy. Red, green, white, blue, color synonymous for role-playing conjury. Mages dominant in offensive, defensive, and supportive properties, each unified by the template. Kemic and his clones put up one of the most intense, arduous fights in the entire story. Reasons being for his versatile set of abilities, self-healing, outrageous attacks, tricky telegraphing, interactive screen chases, temporary stat buffs, and the biggest problem, they all have their own HP. Targeting the original will not work. You have to endure all this crazy shit his clones throw at you. Just, damn. Good job, man. Eat up the good, Smogon. Here's your sweeper. <laughs> To whom it may concern, every story ever written, good doesn't win. Winning would be calling the final shot permanently. Zilch, Coke Zero, not a damn thing to say afterwards. Happily ever after is global warming. Not rail. How can I be so damn bitter over the idea? Because I've seen evil, I've battled evil, and never once did it take its paycheck and squiddaloo. <laughs> Oh, you fuckful sneaks. Teaching the kitties the meaning of life. It's what's on the inside that counts, right? Left! Cackletta's putrid shit smeared soul was Bowser's inside story before Bowser's inside story was Bowser's inside story. Kick the snot out of Boozer, in come Mikey's alarm clock, then the bitch eats you! Spot the inside joke, win a prize. Then you come across Blinky's bowling partner. If you've been with me since day one, you would know Cackletta was the dominator of one of my first text lists. Remember those? Me neither. In other words, this battle has remained one of the top tier in bosses that drive me up the spike wall nads first. No way is that another hipster's oath, as nearly everyone whom grew attached to Superstar Saga resents this wench the very same way. But after going back to it for the fifth time total, something paired alongside the bunker of F-nukes. 
genuine appeal. It's true that a hard boss isn't the same as a bad boss, but on top of castrating me silly, Cacolita's Soul is a great boss battle at the core. This battle is a hellish mishmash of hard hit, dodge well, and a VR simulation set to clutch your remaining chunks of sanity, Cacolita's Soul has a surplus of 1200 health. Sounds tiny by RPG standards, but let me put it this way. That's over twice the amount of every other boss in the whole game. And that's just her weak point. She gets both her arms and head to protect the beefy pain beacon. Her miscolored black heart. No, fuck you, Staples! It's a Reggie Rock boner! It's not enough that the boss's structure forces you to prioritize attacks on certain parts, but whenever you do rip the heart open, you have a very strict and brief window of time to attack it. Oh, and all of Kekleta's appendages attack, too. Yep. Not to mention, the heart heals their health. For the entirety of the adventure, you've been playing an overpowered two-man combo against puny little infantry. It's only at the end where you start to feel their pain. You literally wake up with only one HP. If your speed is even a point under 120, Cacleto will attack first and will most likely kill you before you can even heal. God damn! While it amazes me at its difficulty, it stimulates the life out of me. It reflects the greater good of the game to a point, and supplies a powerful adrenaline charge. For a character born with no soul, it brings vitality into this otherwise really easy game. And that's a kick we all needed. For the first and so far only time in the series, the third game allows the lucky buyers to play as Koopzilla. Very different from the way the plumbers fight, and conditions require Mario and Luigi to manipulate Bowser from the inside, that sounds disgusting, to triumph over the kingdom's fuffalized dangers. But, what would happen if the tank you were driving bit the dust? As if to say, it's Pancake Night! Enter the Rump Command, Bowser's very own coma insurance. Hey god, could we make that a thing? Play some Xevious and BAM! Kaiju Cakes! <laughs> Like trains? Fuck yeah you do! I've never rode one of these things in my life. Watching shit like Anastasia and Prisoner of Azkaban kinda turned me off, but now... Oh, oh, I love you, Santa! Ticket sales for the Fawful Express are about in the triple negative digits. By common consensus, this is the most aggravating of all the giant battles. I can definitely see the base of that, but its core design, I can personally really get behind. While every other giant boss allowed the player to be loose here and there, the Monty Pie faces driving this thing beg to preach. Hey, you know what? Fuck your comfort, bros of gables! Now the question is, how does one fight a train? Simple. Rip out the Johnny card. Stay on its ass and berate it to hell. Rather than a direct approach, the moles drive away for the most part, attempting to make it past a rickety bridge, ending Bowser's dry humpage. Since the fucking thing's so short, in no way can you punch it. Only the flame will work. Meanwhile, they squirm chumbas at your feet, and something real smart, using the terrain to the greatest advantage. Driving past large rock blockades, shooting a missile at you while you're kept busy. And it really hurts if you don't do it in time. Here's my favorite part. Seriously, not enough that the hills have eyes. No! They got arms and feet, too! Somebody call my shrink! The hill monster turns this battle into a half-on-rails, half-face-off type of hybrid. It makes use of clouds and sentience in attempt to heal, damage, and push you away. It's just a nice punching bag to clobber against the blockades. God damn, that's sick. Stick to your guns closely and you'll eventually get them. Of all the giant battles, this one has my favorite setup. It's got a challenge factor the previous ones don't have as well, and the time crunch scenario actually feels rewarding to pull through. It's not beginner friendly, hell no. But it's definitely the one I would choo choose for my favorite giant battle in the game. Kick to the nads? Sure. Call me a girly girl, cause I felt nothing. <laughs> You know, originally I wasn't even going to have this boss on the list, primarily from misleading memories. But after giving the second in the series an unbelievably recent playthrough, I remember exactly why it's a fan favorite. Cuddle with your partner's game cart. Big Sis is paying a visit. You guys were wanting more light on it, and here's where you get it. The shrews, what are fleshed out as typical aliens, are little more than the dank, sickly purple, lightning rods, soaking up lost humanity, depraved monsters of immense sizes and limitless numbers. And when you take down their ruler, it's only replaced by the supreme elder, the queen of the cretins, elder, Princess Shrew. It shouldn't have come as a surprise that the princess you see wasn't the height of royalty. The battle with her was fun for me, but its lack of difficulty marked me skeptical. Well, voila, meet the she-devil. The first phase involves a collaborative sort of approach. 
from both sides. Peach is involved, a la Behind the Throne, sharing stars as projectiles, and the She-Devil has her drones hovering above. Her attacks are dependent on how many saucers are present. Healing, summoning guided troop chomps and meteorites, raining laser blasts down at you from above in the background, and, huh, they've got football on their planet. Oh, and yeah, three and a half thousand health! Already starting off as an improved performance from Little Sis, but it's crazy to think. It's only phase one. Look at that. Just... Wow. It's horrendous, but somehow incredible. She doubles in size, grows mode 7 tentacles, and the guys behind the orchestra are in terror. Elder Princess Shroob is infamous, and it's almost entirely for this second phase. We know the Shroobs to be monsters, but this is scary, even for what we've seen. Their ruler. A monster so fierce, so ugly, it causes Peach to faint on the spot. The amount of health may be similar to the first phase, but the structure is completely different. Much like Cacleta's soul, her appendages keep her weak spot, the head, protected. Yeah, now that I think about it, it's very similar to that battle in more than just that way. The attack patterns are similar, the number of appendages extends her turn, and it's very difficult. Not as difficult for me, personally, but for how long this battle goes on, it's easy to become frustrated. Whereas the last final battle deliberately put you at a disadvantage, this one likes to test how much of her shit you can handle, and for how long. It's enough to fill asylums. Even though the design is inspired greatly from its predecessor, I feel that very aspect is the driving point. It's amazing how long this monster keeps you busy. The music paints this as a cinematic tragedy. A lot of lives are on the line, and it's depressing to see how far the shrooms will go for the pursuit of destruction. I admire it more as an act of despair than a battle, which is honestly what keeps it from ranking higher, but damn, what a way to end. Giant Luigi versus Giant Bowser. Hmm, one on one. Go! Aw oh, yeah, the giant Bowser battle from Dream Team. Sick to his stomach from irony, Bowser is finally done helping your fuzzy faces. Time to re-show the world what put him in the record books. No genius, no curvy swerries, just a titanic beast he is at heart. Rekindling his inner kaiju once again, we finally see Bowser's gargantuation pitted against his greatest adversaries. A love letter too big for postage. For iconic value on its own, I hereby proclaim this the King Kong vs. Godzilla of gaming. It's just... Ugh, so damn cool! It's a bit like the movie in a way, too. It's a showdown between two colossal enemies, with a thematic backdrop. King Kong, Luigi in this case, is the intruder, taking a fight on his opponent's turf. Tokyo for Godzilla, dreamy Neo Bowser Castle for Bowser. Both maintain a faithful focus on the battle, but there are still those cartoony, light-hearted goof-ups. Though, as an added bonus, this fight is still on some serious terms. Both Bowser and dreamy Luigi never give the other chap a break. Something's always going on, whether it's Bowser learning from his mistakes, or the fact that the two constantly jump from one rock to another infinitely. Like all other giant battles, selecting the right move at the right time is crucial. But here, you've got no room to slack. If you don't pull the move on Bowser correctly, it backfires on you. God damn are these guys tough. It's hard to say who's more badass in all this. We've got Bowser over here tanking abuse like a motherfucker, dishing out worse pain than modern Ninja Turtles. But Luigi is such a friggin' underdog. Look at him push, push Bowser back, flings him face first into his own fortress, and oh my god. How could such a silly little thing be so badass? Eventually it turns into Sonic on crack, where the two behemoths clash hammer in a shell in the pilot to Beyblade Budokai. You can't even! Jesus Christ! Can you say best Bowser fight ever? I can. All we need now is the tree for Bowser to choke on. <laughs> Let's talk about Fawful's minion. No, not that faggot. This guy. I don't care to ponder the potential irony about this, but Fawful's main underling is a giant pig. Haven't I had enough of those guys? There's Whizpig haunting my childhood, that stupid pig bike fuckface, and Shitma. But I'm cool with this one. Not only is he amusing, but he's depicted as a Herculean mammalian rival to Bowser, easily keeping up with his brute force, and even looking similar. Midbiss and Bowser butt heads several times in the story, and the clash at the Fawful Theater is definitely an honorable mention. But this spot can be nothing less than his last stance as Blizzard Midbiss. <laughs> I 
I see where this is going. Lots of cool puns to break the ice with. Well, actually, I was gonna talk about how much this fight kicks ass. So don't make me say chill. Going into this fight, you wouldn't have expected it to be dissimilar to previous fights with him. Oh yeah, it is. See, Blizzard Midvis is more than a nice recolor. They took his entire fighting style we saw before and locked it in the freezer, resulting in a flurry of new attacks. Buffle may have shot him with an ice beam, but there's clearly some growth catalysts in it. Because the pork chop not only has the highest HP count of any boss enemy in the game, he can create living snow. More on that in a bit. This is the moment in the game where you start to realize how carefully you need to control Bowser, with this battle easily being the most dangerous Bowser boss. All of Blizzard's attacks are fast, powerful, and tricky. Even missing once on a big attack can cripple you badly, especially with the challenge medal. The snowball attack in the covered up bob on can drive you nuts if you don't use special attacks. Ugh, come on! Hit the mark! You like Dolof? Yeah, we'll meet his crackhead brother. Meet the Snuffles. Their job is simple. Supply immortality. That's right. These little buggers will not only heal Midbis while they're out, they'll make some of his attacks a nightmare to neutralize. Oh, snow cones! In a part for the course turn of creativity, defeating eight inhaled Snuffles will make the fight not so hellish. Plugs up his tube, no less, and your bacon sundae is all licked up. Challenging, fun, complex, and an excellent closure to this quirky rivalry. Spit on those ice ponds all you want. This battle really is cool. <laughs> I bid thee welcome. I am the Bat King. <laughs> <laughs> Down for the count, VR. Ha! No fooling around here. I love this final strife. I pity the fucker real bad, but we shall not grieve. This outstanding fight. Put him into the memory album. In the final hours of this adventure, Entasma evolves into one of the most terrifying creatures. I'm serious. The battle form of the Bat King is scary. Furthering the inspired designs, Entasma has transformed into an abomination reminiscent of all his predecessors. The phantasmic aura and appendages of Cacletta's soul. The sheer immensity of Elder Princess Shrew. The vestment of Dark Fawful. And the power of the Bug's Core. Frankly, this battle feels like a titanic amalgam of every final boss prior. His true power boils down to a flurry of deceptive tricks, insane attacks, and rigorous counterattack endurances. There are tests of all kinds being pushed against you. Managing your own health, attacking consistently enough, clearing your way through his marathon-like countering events, and above all, making for damn sure his energy reserves don't linger. Humorously dubbed Antaz Munchies, these simple orbs are his source of support. Every turn he eats a couple, buffing him with the greater power status and defending him when he attempts to recover health. That sounds like a lot, but there's even more. True Form Entasma is one of the most dangerous bosses in the series, I'd wager, for two special reasons. For one, he can sap you of your power. Yes, he'll occasionally separate Dreamy Luigi from you and imprison him in an Entaz Munchie. Right here is where you should worry, as you can only get him back by destroying the Munchie with real world attacks, which won't work the first turn unless you're overleveled. And if he eats it, you're fighting the devil without a crucifix for about two to three turns. And his last ability is frankly horrifying. If you take enough hits, a dark haze will form around you, which instantly puts Mario to sleep. Think about this for a second. Real world Mario in the dream world falls asleep. Somebody help him! Mario is now forced to run for his life from Entasma, fearfully dodging the Bat King's onslaught of hell, aimlessly searching for the way back to consciousness. It's enough to make you panic. Look at how scared Mario is. Dark pits everywhere. Only one is the way back. All others are flooded with saw blades. If you die in your dream, you die for real. Somebody, get Wes Craven in here. It may not be written down as the final boss, but it's the feeling that counts. The somber music, the unified inspiration, and most importantly, how it plays. Paint this almighty nightmare into a dream come true. <laughs> The last of our big bad bogeys is a leviathan of surreal sensibilities, imposing presence, and masterful boss creation. Ooh, this tastes familiar. You know, I don't get how others find this random and anticlimactic. 
Well, it's my guess they're not dissecting it enough. Dark Bowser is the culmination of both of the narrative's malevolent powers. The Dark Star representing the force of the darkness, and Fawful's bug form represents the dominance of said power, which is what they were for the entire game. An ancient power harnessed by the chess master. The only difference here is that now they're literally one entity. At full power, the star sentience got what it wanted, and Fawful got what he wanted. And take a look how they're assimilated. The artifact of power takes the form of Bowser, and based on what we see, Fafa remains an independent controller. You see what they did here? Vessel and Manipulator! It's exactly how the reluctant alliance of these mortal enemies came to be. So I find it to be symbolic, not random, not in outside referrals, but for the whole idea of this game. This subtle use of undertones is clearly not par for the course, but the battle itself surely is. It's a full-on showdown, by all means, utilizing every bit and piece of the battle system it can, seamlessly linking both Bowsers and their inner contents significantly. It starts out with the two brutes clashing with everything they've got, with a cache of 1000 health and the strongest attack stat in the entire game straight in your way. All of Dark Bowser's attacks are uber variations of your own, and they hit hard if you fail to counter. He even uses dark forms of your own minions to come and hurt you. If you bring down all that HP, you're only given a short victory, because Fawful fully revives him every single time he's knocked down. If you don't take down Fawful, this battle lasts forever. You only ever get one shot at it, so you really need to be careful. Punch out the little devil and he'll run away, further indicating that Fawful's the one in control. The first time this happened, I didn't even know what to do. I thought I was supposed to take him down again while the core's out. I had no idea this fight would get any better, but it does. <laughs> This is where it's at. This is the moment Fawful's been waiting six years for. He's got the plumbers right where he needs them. If they can't put him up right here, Bowser, Peach, and their world dies. You'll never be able to win so long as he's up on his tentacles. But you won't even get the chance if you don't take out his glasses. I assure you, while you do this, you're going to regret ever calling him a freak. But after that massive combination of hellish power and the most combined HP of any battle in the game, you get to live out a meme. It's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Every aspect this game stands for, every little detail they could have done, I don't see much absent. I don't mind if you think otherwise. I don't mind if you think my constant praise for it's cliche. I just care about what it is. A powerful sense of finality.